if you look at the energy industries, all of them use derivatives to have predictable cash flows. And in crypto, there's this culture where it's just hold all and pray the price is going to go up. And you saw we've seen bankruptcies the last cycle from, well, I think we know that, you know, the public companies that have gone bankrupt or have had to restructure. And as this industry matures, we're going to see these companies more and more use derivatives to ensure that this super volatile asset doesn't put them out of business and instead works to their advantage. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. My name is Jared, and today I get to sit down and talk with the co-founder and CEO of Two Prime, Alex Bloom. Alex, how are you? I'm doing great. I, uh, I'm just hanging out, working away. How are you? Same, doing great, hanging out, working away. This episode is actually being recorded early October and will come out kind of mid-October. So before we get going, if anything crazy in the world happens in crypto and Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and we don't talk about it, that is why. It's not that we're not up to date on stuff because we're obviously going to be talking about some crypto, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin mining today. And Alex, before we dive into 2 Prime, and I think I got your kind of go-ahead to do this before we recorded, I kind of want to talk about your background I talk about this every once in a while on this podcast when it makes sense, when it adds value. But I was in the Peace Corps back in Central America. I started in 2010, went to 2012 in Guatemala. And then from 2012 to 2013, I was in Colombia doing a, a different project, obviously in a different country. And it's been an experience that reshaped my life. I want to say shaped my life, but it like reshaped my life because my life was going in a direction. And then I had three years of living in communities that I never thought I would live in working directly with them and having completely different experiences. One of my experiences was spent in the Guatemalan highlands, uh, working with and living with, you know, in high indigenous populations, which I just never thought that I would spend my time there. And it was absolutely amazing to this day. I have people that I consider family there. And then I was on the coast of Colombia. Uh, just, it, you know, I went from the, the high elevation of the Guatemalan highlands to the heat of the Caribbean coast. And anyways, that's enough about my experience. But I do know when I was looking over your background, one of the things you have on your Forbes under for, for their digital assets in your bio, it says, you know, prior... Uh, Alex served in the Peace Corps in Panama. So it's clearly been something that's been foundational for you. Maybe it, as I said, reshaped or shaped your future. So I kind of want to start there if you could. And if you can give me the, the broad brushstrokes of how you went from being a Peace Corps volunteer, probably in the early 2010s, to now running 2 Prime. Well, right before I joined the Peace Corps, I was working for a congressman in DC and I was like, had to wear a suit every day and I was so sweaty. And the congressman like wasn't, he didn't even like he was writing up bills he knew would never pass just so he could get reelected. And I was like, I'm at the bottom of a ladder. I don't even want to climb. And I, I was like, I got to get out of this place. And I joined the Peace Corps. And really, I, I thought I undergrad, I studied English literature at Tufts University and thought I would go there and write a novel and just have some adventures. And then I got there. I, I lived with an indigenous community and in, called Nobe is the, the uh, tribe uh, in Panama, close to Costa Rica. And, you know, I thought. It'd be just a fun adventure, but people like literally had like tuberculosis and had no food and it just seemed kind of silly to sit around and make up stories. Um, and what I found was I ended up working with an artisan group of pretty much grandmothers who made bags out of plants and used flowers to make dyes. And I helped them set up consignment agreements with businesses throughout the country to um, sell them. And... I was amazed. I was like, oh, you can use the same creativity and kind of write stories into reality through entrepreneurship. Um, and so while I was there, I also had no phone or internet service. Um, and so when I got back from the Peace Corps, suddenly smartphones had become ubiquitous. Uh, when I had departed, they, it wasn't really completely a thing yet. And so uh, I was like, wow, these magical tools, like if you could just get phone service somewhere, you can change education, you can get access to financial services, um, the whole internet. And so I started a company actually setting up rural cell phone towers that were solar powered and um, was thinking about services you could provide once you got people service, phone internet service and learned about Ripple and Bitcoin and this, you know, where I live, people didn't have mailboxes, they didn't have bank accounts. And so I was thinking, how do you do a remittances to people that don't have a bank account and don't have access to uh, electricity. And um, what they did have was phones they could occasionally charge. And so 
uh, yeah, early in like 2012, I have emails with the, like now the founders of Ripple that were like doing like customer services emails with me being like, how do I get Bitcoin out to these people? And that's how I first learned about Bitcoin. Um, through that startup of the cell phone service startup I had started called Rugged Communications, I uh, went through a business accelerator that was for social good businesses. And one of the mentors that worked with me there was the head of a big VC fund called Tomorrow Ventures. And they also were interested in Bitcoin and crypto, you know, really early on. And so I got some exposure there. And then as things kind of blew up in 16, 17, I, uh, nobody knew anything about crypto. And so my like limited amount of experience with crypto put me miles ahead of almost everybody. Uh, and so I was doing consulting work and just, you know, interest in the industry. And then, um, Actually, sorry, I saw a lot of these companies saw ICOs launch and they were like, oh, wow, I want free money. This sounds great. But once you start dealing with U.S. like professionals, they realized it was an unregistered security offering. So I saw all these companies I was helping trying to do security tokens, created a platform uh, called Atomic Capital that uh, was a broker dealer and also offered the software for security token issuance. And that company slowly ran out of money and went out of business. But one of the investors in it was a, a man named Mark Flurry, who sold a software company called JBoss for $350 million in 2006. And he was an early crypto Bitcoin investor. And so he's like, let's do something else together now that you lost all of my money in this startup. And um, we started 2Prime, which is the company I run now. And so we were just trading our own Bitcoin and ETH at first. And then that expanded out to some friends. And then now we service institutional investors, publicly traded Bitcoin miners. Uh, we have some of the founders of Tether, our clients of ours and beyond, and um, really expertise is in algorithmic derivatives trading. And I've hired a bunch of people way smarter than me that um, have helped to build that out over the last six years. Thank you for first indulging and taking us from the Peace Corps all the way up to 2 Prime. And I think it's incredible to hear about rugged communications because at the time I left the Peace Corps, there was a lot of people trying to wrap their heads around with, okay, now that people have connectivity through some kind of smart technology, basically through their cell phone, we used to have, you know, basically phones that could only run the game Snake back in the day in the Peace Corps. And now right. obviously <laughs> things are different. But going from there, I now see through rugged communications into the atomic capital and how you get to two prime. So thank you for kind of going on that journey. And I think it adds just so much veritas to the experience that you've had and how you've got here. And I know for me personally, having lived in communities without electricity, worked in communities without running water, to think about how they can partake now, especially in the Bitcoin global ecosystem, is really good. And I think it's a humbling thing to have constantly present um, and as we build for the future. So here we are now, you are on the Compass Mining Podcast. Talk to me a little bit about 2 Prime and how you're supporting Bitcoin miners and just Bitcoin in general, people who are in Bitcoin. Where is the connective tissue between the mining community and what 2 Prime offers as far as services? Yeah. So, you know, for us, we understand Bitcoin mining as very similar to other energy businesses, oil or natural gas. They're producing a commodity. They have variable pricing of that commodity, but fixed costs as a business. And so... Um, what we see on the miner side is basically uh, three kind of buckets of needs that they have. One is just a lot of them have a bunch of Bitcoin and it just sits idle or actually not a lot of them, but some of them have a bunch of Bitcoin uh, and it just sits idle. A lot of them don't have Bitcoin because in the last crash, they didn't plan things well and they had to sell the Bitcoin to stay afloat or they went bankrupt. Um, for the ones that do have Bitcoin, uh, you can do stuff with that. You, If you had like let's say a billion dollars of cash, you wouldn't just sit it in a bank account and do nothing with it. You would trade it or you'd put it into some kind of yield generating product. So it's working for you. And so uh, what we see is some Bitcoin miners doing similar stuff where they're employing derivative strategies to generate a yield on that Bitcoin. That could be, you know, largely what we're doing is selling options premium in order to uh, harvest a yield and then uh, just repeating that over and over. There's some, each miner, you know, we offer at 2Prime, we're a registered investment advisor. We offer separately managed accounts. So it's not like a fund. Every client we're running different strategies for. And so we have some miners that, you know, they just want to get long calls or um, take more risk. But generally they're looking to put to work that stack of Bitcoin if they have it. 
Uh, another major issue for miners is just, hey, I own all this Bitcoin and we have a balance sheet, but if Bitcoin drops 50% or the mining cost to mine Bitcoin becomes unprofitable, I'm out of business or I'm running at a loss and I don't know when it's going to end. And so there are also derivative strategies like selling a call spread, which gives you a credit that you could then use to buy a put. And so you can set a floor price for the value of your Bitcoin you're either mining on a monthly basis or that you already have in your coffers and you're trading a little bit of upside in order to get that protection. But you know that you're going to be in business the next one year, two years, rather than you know, praying that the price of Bitcoin goes up. Um, and then the last thing is there are miners that have a bunch of cash on hand that they're not using dollars. And, you know, a lot of people put that into treasuries, but you can also run the basis trade on Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies where you buy spot and sell a future at a dated future. And you can earn the premium as long as you hold it to expiration. And almost always the premium on that basis trade is greater than what you can make owning treasuries. And so there's some uh, benefit to, to doing that if you can understand how all that stuff works. So those are the main things we see miners doing. And, you know, last thing I would just say is if you look at the energy industries, all of them use derivatives to have predictable cash flows. And in crypto, there's this culture where it's just hold all and pray the price is going to go up. And you saw, we've seen bankruptcies the last cycle from, well, I think we know that, you know, the public companies that have gone bankrupt or have had to restructure. And as this industry matures, we're going to see these companies more and more use derivatives to ensure that this super volatile asset doesn't put them out of business and instead works to their advantage. I'm not sure how much and what content you consume from Bitcoin land. Were you able to, and I was not even thinking this until what you just said about the you know, hodl and prey strategy that a lot of people incorporate in the, you know, crypto and Bitcoin world. Were you able to catch the podcast that was recently released? I believe it was on Siphidian's podcast where he had on Michael Saylor. Did you see any clips from that? And if not, I can give you a, a rundown. <laughs> I saw a clip where Saylor was talking about making this a productive asset and um, Siphidian yes. was saying like, oh, that's like bullshit basically or crazy. Yes, yes, exactly. Because that seems to see, I feel like that's a crux in much of the industry for people that hold that hold, you know, some blockchain backed asset, as I call them. They don't want to give up their, they're like not interested in yield because there's a fear that they're going to potentially lose the asset to a third party from which they're getting the yield. And this is where Bitcoiners will say, hey, we're really not interested in the Ethereum yield because we don't, A, want the underlying Ethereum, the underlying Ethereum, nor do we kind of want to even put ourselves in a not your keys, not your coin situation. So I guess my question, I'm glad you saw the clip. I saw like four or five clips and I know that that kind of went viral on Bitcoin X, which was like Siphidian saying, you don't understand. And Michael Saylor saying, you don't understand. And those are two people that many Bitcoiners have listened to at one time or the other and probably gained some value. So it was interesting to see like Batman fight Superman on a podcast. But can you kind of talk through what maybe, you know, if I have a hundred Bitcoin and I'm a miner and I'm like, come to you and I'm like, we want to make this more productive. I think that's a word you just used and it's very applicable here. Can you walk me through the safety around me not losing the hundred Bitcoin in my pursuit of getting more productivity from that hundred Bitcoin? Yes. Um, and that's, you know, I think the perspectives of Sailor and uh, Siphidian are both valid. It's just different experiences and it's a ultimately a value judgment of do you prize, you know, security and certainty above everything? Are you willing to take a little bit of risk in order to get some upside? You know, there's no free lunch. And so even if you have your like money on the New York Stock Exchange and US Treasuries uh, are, you know, you have money in US Treasuries, like there's a risk. It's not zero risk. The US government could become insolvent. The New York Stock Exchange could be hacked. Like it's pretty good and they have a really good track record, but there's never zero risk in anything. In crypto, we don't have the same level of institutional infrastructure as like the New York Stock Exchange and SEC regulated rules for everything. And so there's a heightened level of infrastructure risk. Um, you know, most derivatives are options, I should say, I think like 93% are traded on Deribit, which is a, I believe, Dubai registered exchange that has 
been through a bunch of ups and down cycles and actually had one hack that the company itself covered the costs of. And, you know, so there's some risk there. Uh, at 2Prime, we uh, use off-exchange custodies. There's a few companies that where you can keep your assets at a custodian and Deribit via API can see that you have the assets and you can still trade. So companies that offer that are like Copper or Fireblocks. I believe that BitGo and Bact are also offering that product on, on Deribit pretty soon. However, like, you know, so you, you don't have your money on the exchange if Deribit gets hacked, but now you have the risk of, well, what if the custodian gets hacked? Um, and so somewhere along the way, you have to trust somebody is doing something right. Um, you know, the other benefit is if you're using a qualified custodian like Fireblocks just became or uh, Bitco just became, you know, these assets become bankruptcy remote. And so, as you know, even if Bitco goes out of business, like I still own this Bitcoin, which is, you know, like in the case of BlockFi or FTX is not the case. It goes to the estate and you're screwed or you're in like a legal battle for years to get your money recovered. And then you don't even get the full amount back. So that being said, um, I think that like the infrastructure is pretty good. Like if you look at Copper's track record with Deribit or Fiberlock's track record with Deribit, uh, it's as safe as you can pretty much get at this point. And then if you're working, like we're a regulated company. And so like, if I steal your money, like I, I'm on the rent, like I'm going to jail. Like I, I, the stakes are pretty high for, for me to comply with the law as well. Um, but it's, you know, it's not zero risk. That's true. Um, and so I think hardcore Bitcoin libertarian people are going to say, it's not worth it. Just own the Bitcoin. It's good enough. Like you don't need to take extra risk, but you know, if you're running a public company, you're in a competitive marketplace where there's other places I can get Bitcoin exposure. There's other places yield is being generated. You know, Sailor has a different set of pressures and priorities than an individual would have. And so needs to keep, keep running up the score. And, you know, I think it's also interesting with MicroStrategy, they talk about yield on their Bitcoin on a quarterly basis. And what they're talking about is how much Bitcoin is owned per share. But the reality is the reason they're doing that, I think they're taking a weakness and turning into trying to turn it into a strength. Because in reality, for every dollar you put into MicroStrategy, you're not getting a dollar of Bitcoin. Over time, it's getting closer to dollar to dollar parity. And so what they're talking about in yield is basically how much more dollars of Bitcoin you're getting per share of MicroStrategy. But the answer is always still less than one to one. And so it's interesting they talk about it that way, but you're starting off bad or like below below parity of just buying bitcoin um so it's a little bit uh some ch- like a smoke and mirrors there in my opinion yeah i'm always interested to see sailor do that particular dance when he's when he does talk about that the stock the micro strategy stock in relation to bitcoin it loses me every time and yeah thank you for bringing up that trauma i lost money in block fi still haven't seen it and yeah, every once I'm, in a while I'm, are you, are you in the same I'm not, but my mother and my mother-in-law are, and they're not pleased with me. <laughs> I have friends that are not pleased with me to this day over BlockFi, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, the, I think the, in, the, in the search of yield in the last bull run, a lot of people got really hurt through FTX and especially BlockFi. And it's really weird now because BlockFi now is going to pay me out through Coinbase and so every other week I'll get some email and it's like, we just sent you one, one thousand, one, one thousandth of a USDC. I'm like, thank you guys. You, you've saved yeah. me. I, I'll, I'll be good. I'm retiring tomorrow. Thank you for this. So, yeah. uh, I, but I had to ask, I had to ask about that because I think it's a very interesting thing thinking about Bitcoin as productive yield. And as you guys are SEC registered advisors, one of the questions that I really, when I was like, okay, I'm going to talk to, you know, Alex from two prime is when do you think there will be a way for TradFi for me to go into my local bank or my bigger bank, whatever that is, you know, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, JP chase, uh, Bank of America, when will I be able to, as a citizen of the United States with Bitcoin, per your opinion, be able to go get yield, have some kind of a, some kind of a joint custody thing, or as you've said with the Darabit, where they can see that I own this many sats and then I can get fiat loans. For you, strictly opinion, when do you think that that is going to come to fruition? Well, so it's kind of touches on something I wanted to, I should have mentioned in the last bit I was saying, but 
you know, the other, like, if you don't trust this new crypto infrastructure, there are the Bitcoin ETFs, which are within regular traditional finance infrastructure and has opened up, you know, ways for that money to get exposure. You know, you're still taking a risk where you have to trust BlackRock or Fidelity or Bitwise to not screw up. Um, but if like they can't get it right, these massive companies, then uh, I don't like I don't know who can get it right at that point. And basically, all of them have custody of Coinbase. So really, it's just a question of if you think Coinbase can keep ten percent, I think of all the Bitcoin in the world secure or not. Um, and Ooh. so. Within that, if you're willing to not own Bitcoin directly, but own the ETF, you know, that's a way to get rid of a lot of these Deribit and, you know, crypto native risks. And there will be, op- there already are futures on, uh, well, there are Bitcoin futures and then there will be futures and options on these ETFs, at least the most liquid ones. I believe the SEC approved the BlackRock ETF. There's a few other approvals, but probably within six months you could get, um exposure to Bitcoin and with some of these yield strategies and there will be ETFs and there will be funds that are trading the ETF and using the same strategies we use. We're, we're in talks with clients that want to do that as soon as the options on the ETFs become available. And so, you know, I think there'll be ways for people to get exposure to that within the next, I don't know, six months or so, nine, six, nine months. Um, but you know, they're going to mostly be simple strategies. It'll be like, oh, we're, we sell a covered call every month and we get the yield, except, you know, our feeling, we actively manage, you know, through algorithms, how we trade. These really simple strategies, because of the volatility of Bitcoin, tend to not work that well over time, but they're easy to explain and easy to get approved. And so you end up with these basic products at the get-go. Um, so, Yeah. I think that's kind of what's in the the pipeline in terms of regular people getting exposure to yield strategies through banks. You brought up the ETFs and it made me think of a couple other things. And so before I ask them, when was you had Atomic Capital and then that was kind of flipped into two prime, as you said, your co-founder was like, well, you failed at that one. Let's, let's move on (laughs) to the next one, right? Let's take our learnings and move forward. When was two prime founded? Uh, 2019. Okay, that was actually the number in my head, which is great because in 2020, in August of 2020, that is when Michael Saylor goes ahead and he, I don't know, takes 250 million, I think, and buys Bitcoin. That and then the ETFs, I think, were massive moments for TradFi because since Saylor has bought that, obviously he's you know created this new blueprint on a way to be able to build fiat stock price for a publicly traded company. And then obviously on January 10th of this year, we see the ETFs launched. How have both of those events uh, directly or indirectly impacted what two prime is doing as far as the services it's offering? Like, has it been easier to have conversations with high net worth individuals or publicly traded companies or private companies be like, Hey, look what sailors doing. Or, Hey, the sec has just approved 11 ETFs. If you could talk about that, cause what I'm trying to get at is a little bit better of an, un- an understanding of the environmental and like shift around Bitcoin. And I guess we could say crypto, but a, a focus on Bitcoin. Yeah. So first I would say that like people who work in finance are largely cowards and followers. Uh, and <laughs> everybody's, everybody is, uh, risk, risk first, uh, which is, which is appropriate, but everyone's trying to not lose money. Like, and so if you don't buy some like crazy speculative asset and it goes up, it's like, okay, you missed one. But if you buy something, it crashes or gets hacked. You got, you don't have a job anymore. Like you don't run a pension fund anymore. You're an unemployed failure. And so, everyone's looking for somebody else to go first. It's true in venture capital too. Every like VC fund just wants to know what other VC fund is in the investment. And so groups like MicroStrategy or I think more significantly BlackRock and Fidelity saying, we have a product here. This is a legitimate investment. Um, kind of gives institutions cover to uh, get involved themselves because it's like, well, yeah, we were wrong, but BlackRock was wrong too. So, I mean, we're not like, we're not dumb. Like everybody seem to think this was a good idea. And so I think it's made it easier for institutions to bring this to like their network of uh, investors or family offices to add a bit of this into a portfolio. You know, I think especially in finance, there's so many statistics and return profiles and track records. And it's like, at the end of the day, things come down to trust and judgment. And all those things are sort of signals to people that something's a good or bad idea. 
but there's a lot of um, emotion and like trust and uh, social aspect to it as well. And so I think that um, it's now reasonable socially to have some exposure to this. And then you start getting this kind of game theory effect where it's like, oh, well, this other multifamily office has a 2% exposure and we don't. And they're up 10% more than us this year. And, you know, they're trying to keep pace with their competitors. And so I think slowly it's being socialized and it makes it easier for people to work with us or, you know, they realize that they should engage in the conversation. It's not, it's not fringe anymore. That's great to hear. Cause that's at least how it's felt. I first got into Bitcoin in 2017 and I feel like with every bull run really, cause obviously the downtimes is where people are like, see, you're crazy. See, this isn't going to work. And I think that's like society saying that to the industry at large as we go into 2025 and we start to go up the roller coaster for lack of a better analogy, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. More attention is going to come back. More people are probably going to be like, hey, 2Prime, how can you help out? I've been holding this Bitcoin thing that somebody told me to buy in 2021. What what, what can I do with it now? Can you, and, I, and I'm not sure if it was you or somebody yesterday or was in a podcast, my mind is blending and you're going to have to, please excuse me for that. But somebody was saying, now is the time before we go up the roller coaster to start to think about how we protect ourselves from bankrupt in when the roller coaster goes down, right? And could yeah. you talk to me a little bit about that? Are you already starting to like, you know, have those conversations with clients? Yes. Um, it is as soon as you're like on the roller coaster ride, it's emotional, it's kind of a drug. And so it's not a great time to be thinking clearly about when I want to get off the ride. Uh, when's a good time is now to have a plan and it says, you know, I think an issue a lot of people make with investing is they're like, I'm going to hold this thing and I want to sell it at the top cent and buy it at the bottom cent that nobody knows what that is in advance rather than saying, well, I have these goals for my life. I, if I have, you know, $20 million, I can retire, take care of my family and like write a novel. Uh, that's my goal. Uh, and so <laughs> Like, where does this need to go for me to reach those goals? And I'm going to get off the ride then because I'm trying to make the investment work for me. Like, I don't work for the investment. And so with our clients, we meet with them. We've been meeting with them already and saying, all right, like, what's at 100K? Like, what's the playbook for you? Do you want to keep going? Do you want to, you know, cut half of your exposure or go into like dollar-based strategies? And that answer is different for everybody. And there's not a right answer. It's just a question of, where you're at in life, your financial goals, and what kind of risks you're comfortable taking. Um, and it's hard to see that stuff clearly when you're up 70% in a month or something. And it's like, well, this thing's, this, this is the best drug I've ever taken. I mean, this is things going up forever. And it, that's not the right time to, to think clearly. That's a great way to put it. And it's almost like if you go to a house party and you're like, I need to leave by midnight, no matter what's happening, like no matter how good the DJ is, no matter what I'm drinking, no matter who I'm talking to, no matter the, I haven't seen this friend, I have to leave the house party at midnight. I think that's a pretty good way to look at it. And I hope it's something that I can stick to too, because I know you want to write a novel at 20 million. And I know I have some other goals just personally with family and stuff that I, I know I want to get done. And I think Bitcoin is an absolute vehicle to freedom. And everyone defines that differently. Uh, it could be time freedom, location freedom, or you know, financial freedom. So, thank you for kind of outlining that. I was, I was, I was interested in that. And then, Bitcoin miners. Let's go back to the miners. That's why we're here. Many miners are listening. And as you know, Cumbers Mining, we have a minimum order quantity of one. So there could be someone listening to this who has one ASIC up and running hosted with us. There could be somebody listening who has 500 ASICs. There could be someone listening who's part of a, you know, who maybe runs a publicly traded Bitcoin mining company, but they're not taking advantage of the services that 2Prime has. If you could, could you talk to the minimum order quantity of one and then somebody who maybe has a thousand ASICs up and just say, hey, as we go up the roller coaster, here's the stuff that I think we can offer you. Now, obviously, we can't talk about these two hypothetical people's goals, which I know would help orientate the conversation. But if you could, you know, please try and talk to those two uh, customer segments. So we're more on the institutional side. So that's what I'm more familiar with. I think if you have one ASIC and you're in a mining pool, you know, this is just like a side hustle, you know, income stream and like you're okay with the the risk and you know you're not depending on your life's like net worth on that one ASIC and so I would say just let it ride or you know um, it's really tough you know to 
trade options or futures if you're you know if you have like a tenth of a bitcoin or something though i, I think you you can get some exposure potentially but you know you could you know see where you can get that way and so i there's not you know there's not much you can do to be honest if you're if you're that small of size um if you're you know you're mining a couple megawatts of of bitcoin and producing 10 30 100 bitcoin a month or greater you know, I think there's a couple, a number of things you can do. One is, um, well, one thing that we see, we see a lot of miners that have a policy. They get Bitcoin, they sell it uh, day of or week of. And if you don't need the cash right away, what you can do is sell a future on the Bitcoin that expires in a month or three months. And you're going to get historically like 5 to 10% greater dollar value premium off that Bitcoin through selling it as a future rather than just selling it spot. Um, so that's one way to just make more money off the Bitcoin that you're mining. Um, you know, the main thing we talk about with miners is, okay, what are your operational expenses for, you know, primarily power is the number one. And then do you have any future expansion plans? Um, and if so, you know, what also, what's, what's it cost you to mine a Bitcoin? And so, um, you know, if it's 50 K per Bitcoin or, you know, 40, 50 K is where we see a lot of the larger miners at, um, well, you might want to make a price floor at around there. Um, and so you're going to buy puts at 45, 50 K. And that way you can breathe easy knowing like, no matter what happens, I can like produce at break even. And I don't have to worry about going out of business. The trade-off there is usually to do that. You're going to sell a call or a call spread in order to finance the cost of it. And so you might not see the entire upside if Bitcoin rips to 150 K. But to me, it's like, I'd rather stay in business and not make every, make only 90% of the upside um, and not uh, have to be able to sleep at night. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting, especially with public miners, you know, there's optionality for investors. They're all like, there's the actual quality of what you're doing. And then there's the perception and stock price. And so um, I think that right now, like almost everybody has a hodl strategy or there's minimal derivatives-based stuff that's expressed publicly. But I think there's a space for some miners to say, hey, we're here for the long run. We have this strategy that preserves like downside. You don't have to worry about bankruptcies with us. And we're going to survive long-term and let other companies go out of business or be absorbed by companies like ours. And uh, a derivative strategy helps you make that argument. But I, I don't see a lot of groups marketing that right now. Most people are buying Bitcoin mining stocks because – they want Bitcoin upside. Um, and so these companies feel a pressure to like be hodl and go super long. But I think since the ETF has come out, like there's another option that's just, I can just pretty much own Bitcoin directly. And so I think these miners are trying to figure out how do I make a case for investing in my stock when uh, there's other options that give you direct Bitcoin exposure. So um, I think it's another way to think about how to bring a derivative strategy that both is better for your business and how you can communicate that to investors to uh, garner more belief in, in your company. Um, yeah. And then I think, you know, the last thing, like I said before, is just if you're holding a bunch of dollars, a lot of them are, have hundreds of millions in U S treasuries earning 5% and it's going to be going down as the fed cuts rates um, and Bitcoin basis trade, which if you understand what's happening, there is a Delta neutral low risk trade is a way you can uh, make better yield on, on dollars as well. But, you know, the specifics of every company, like their operational expenses are different. Their personnel costs are different. Some of them have 10 other ventures going on and they're, you know, they have different, different kind of capital structures. Um, but there's derivative strategies that can ameliorate some of the risk for pretty much any company. Yeah. When I asked you that question, I knew it was kind of an impossible question. I'm asking <laughs> a uh, F1 pit crew to help me with my Toyota Corolla, but I figured I'd ask it because I think it's interesting. You know, I think it's interesting for someone who even has an, uh, you know, one ASIC hosted with us to hear how, if they were to grow their fleet, they would then be able to maybe leverage the Bitcoin they have to be able to access different yeah. things. So, and then, yeah. you know, the other thing I, I meant to talk about is, you know, for bigger companies that are looking to grow their business or their footprint, you know, we've seen the last cycle and we're seeing it now that a lot of these miners take out Bitcoin secured loans or sometimes they're, like ASIC secured or they're, you know, secured by cash flows, but uh, the market for Bitcoin secured loans is coming back to life. We uh, are able to offer Bitcoin secured loans where you can send us Bitcoin, we give you cash. Usually it's 60 to 70% of the value of that Bitcoin. And then you can 
buy more ASICs or buy another, you know, mining facility and, and grow that way uh, while still holding the original Bitcoin and just paying interest on it. And there's also like, you know, you could, we do loans at like uh, around nine or nine and a half percent uh, dollar interest per year. And so there you could take the cash and there are a number of derivative strategies, both with Bitcoin or on dollars where you can offset a lot of the cost of paying the interest or, you know, all these Bitcoin secured loans, if the price of Bitcoin drops, now you have a margin call and that's when you get bankruptcies and liquidations, but you can have option strategies that ensure that, you know, if I get a crash, well, I'm accruing Bitcoin through my options positions that will be able to cover the margin call on my loan. And so I can, again, sleep easy at night knowing I'm not going to get liquidated. Uh, So we see groups, I think, doing that a little bit and it'll increase over time. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I think for me personally, being able to use my Bitcoin in the future to kind of like the way people use their houses to get HELOCs. I just think that there's many Bitcoiners that I speak to and I'm one of them that's really waiting and keeping a certain amount of Bitcoin on the side to that is fully open. And those interest rates are really competitive because they existed even in the last bull run, but some of the interest rates were just way above what it would be to just go get a SoFi or whatever, like four or five times. And I get that the volatility of Bitcoin over a short enough time period. Um, so that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I was just going to add there that, um, you know, I think that because of the, what happened with BlockFi and Genesis, um, a lot of people got burned. And so, you know, I think it's important, like there's going to be Bitcoin based lending, just like, you know, I, I'm like a JP Morgan private wealth client. I can get a loan off my stock portfolio at JP Morgan. And it makes a sense. I mean, we have clients with a lot of Bitcoin that they just treat it like that. Like I need some cash flow. I don't want to sell my assets. Um, I think the key is, in my opinion, to find lenders that are not rehypothecating or trading the collateral. And so with BlockFi, Celsius, all these groups, they blew up because they were taking your Bitcoin and then they were trying to make more money off it. They were tra- lending the Bitcoin out to somebody or they were trading it or BlockFi put it into like this grayscale ARB trade that blew up and they lost hundreds of millions. But there are lenders. I mean, when we lend, it's not re It just sits in a different wallet and doesn't get traded. You can see where it is at all times. And so there's really not a lot that can go wrong. Or the, you know, the, what can go wrong is the price of Bitcoin crashes and you need to send in more Bitcoin to service the loan, but it's a known risk and it's a known uh, exactly when that will happen. And so I think we'll see a, a lot more of that kind of style of loan um, grow this this uh, cycle. Yeah. You know, one of the things about blockchain that I always found so fascinating was transparency. And I know on your website, which I'll call out and you can call out again a little bit later, but 2prime.io two is the website, but it says, you know, while digital asset trading firms are historically synonymous with opacity or opacity, 2prime uh, brings radical transparency to crypto investing. And is that kind of what you're talking about when you say that, that you can go see your Bitcoin if it is in a loan, you can go, you know, see it on chain. Is that kind of what you guys are calling out there? Oh, uh, it's, a couple of things. I mean, it's culturally throughout the whole company. On the loan side, yes, you can see exactly where your money is sitting and that it hasn't been moved. And on the trading side, for all of our clients, we have a dashboard so they can see in real time how their portfolio is performing, if they're up and down on the month in Bitcoin or dollar terms, what trades they're in and, and any changes that happen. So usually if you have like a hedge fund or trading firm, you might get a monthly or quarterly statement that says you made 12% this quarter and you don't know how it happened or what was traded in our case, you can see all of that in real time. And for many of our clients also like we don't, we don't even have the money that it's in their account. We just have trading access so they can see exactly directly in the account, what is happening. And so, you know, I'm feeling is with what we do with derivatives trading, it's, it's complicated. I could tell you exactly what we do and you still probably couldn't do it well. And so there's nothing for us to, to hide. It's the execution of it. Like everyone knows like, yeah, like, sell options so you make more money. It sounds like really good, but it's hard to do on such a volatile asset. And so, you know, we've just taken the approach of, you don't need to sign an NDA. Like we'll tell you exactly what we're doing and show you what we're doing. And uh, I think with the track record of this industry and just how I want to live my life, like I like doing things openly like that. And so that's some of what that, that says on our website is about that. Amazing. Yeah. It's really cool to hear that you have like a, a real time dashboard, especially with Bitcoin, right? I mean, there are people that look at mempools.space all day long because they're fascinated that you can kind of go see everything that's happening. So 
Alex, I want to give you a chance now before we wrap up, and I know I just called out the website, 2prime.io, very clean website URL. Uh, could you shout out where people can get in touch with you if they want to follow up? I believe LinkedIn is an option. I believe you're also on X, but if you want to shout out every place where you are or 2prime is and where people should look to get in touch with you. Yeah, I mean, you can message me directly. My email is alexander.bloom at twoprime.fund. Even even though it's dot fund, we are not a fund, just to be clear. But uh, that is our, my email address, alexander.bloom at twoprime.fund. Or yeah, I'm on Twitter at, at Alexander S. Bloom. The same on Telegram, at Alexander S. Bloom. And uh, yeah, happy to be in touch. Sweet. I'm going to add all of those links in the episode description. So whether you're listening to this on YouTube or on podcast platforms, please go ahead and subscribe and be sure to follow us at Compass Mining on socials on X, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And I'll leave once again, all of Alex's contact information in the episode description. Alex, thank you so much for hopping on the pod and taking the time today. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. 